Welcome to The Cabral Concept, where board-certified doctor of naturopathy, Dr. Stephen Cabral, shares with you exactly how you can reverse aging, take back your health, and live a life full of energy and passion with new 20-minute episodes every single day to keep you healthy and engaged. Now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. So glad you could join me here today. This episode 2805 of the Cabral Concept is going to be a fun one today. Sure, it'll be a controversial show, but I always want to share with you that it is not my goal to ever be controversial. It just so happens right now talking about protein in the health and wellness and fitness based space is very controversial. And the whole reason and the main reason is this. There are a lot of people out there and rightly so, are putting people on diets that are higher in protein, fairly high in fat, and lower in carbs, and getting them excellent body transformation results, and at the same time, decreasing uh, decreasing diet and digestive-based issues. Okay, so all of that is absolutely true. When I started in personal training, fitness, nutrition, back in the mid to late 90s. That is exactly what we did. And you know what? It works. It works to this day. It works 25 plus years later, and it will always work. A lower carbohydrate, higher protein, moderate to high fat diet, as long as there's not a caloric surplus, will work. The problem is that it does have long-term detrimental effects that people just don't like to talk about. They brush that under the rug. And it's because in the short term, what are you doing? Well, as a coach or as an influencer or whatever it might be, you're getting people what they're looking for, which honestly, for a lot of people, they want weight loss, okay? And for other people, they don't want the digestive bloat. And if you remove the fermentable carbohydrates, well, there's nothing really to bloat right? And so what happens is they get this false sense of security that everything is good, but it's not good. Like that's what I want to share with you because I look at everything from an integrative health perspective. And I always tell people, I don't care what side is right. I look at the clinical research and there can be differing views in clinical research. There always are. I look at what they did in Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, bioregulatory medicine, traditional naturopathy. I look at it all. And I look at what works in clinical practice. But then I always want to say this. What works today and for you right now in the short term may not be the most advantageous for living a long, healthy life. And that is exactly what I want to share with you here today. I do see the benefits of a high protein diet. I used to eat 275 to 300 plus grams of protein per day. Nobody needs that much protein. I mean, they really don't. And so I completely overdid it. But what was I trying to do? I was trying to get my five foot eight frame. And I'm, you know, if I lift weights and I eat naturally like I do right now, I'm about 164 pounds or so. Okay. So I got myself up to 200 pounds by eating that much protein weight training four days a week, be meticulous with everything that I needed to do to manipulate my body to build up my muscles, essentially. And it worked. I used creatine. I used glutamine. I used weight gain based protein shakes. There's no doubt about it. Like that's how I got in like all of these calories. So I'm not saying it doesn't work. But what I want to share with you is that there are long term consequences. And I'm going to link up a lot of the clinical research here today, and you're welcome to read it over. So again, I don't need you to believe me because I'm not asking you to convert to a religion other than your own right now. I'm just talking about research and science. And so I want to share with you at least some research to keep an open mind too, because it does seem that the any increase in protein above 20% of your total macros. So when you look at, if you're eating 2000 calories a day, 20% of 2000 calories is 400, right? And there's four grams uh, of, there's four calories per gram of protein. So a hundred grams of protein would equal that 400 calories, right? And so maybe you're eating more than that. So you can eat maybe more protein. But what I want to share with you is there's a twofold effect. The first one is this, those, and the, the study is very straightforward. Those that ate more than 20% of their diet from protein increased all-cause mortality and even more specifically from cardiovascular disease and cancer. 
Now, it doesn't mean that if you're on a low-protein diet, you won't get cancer, but it just seems that you have less of a chance. And there's one specific amino acid that they studied that seemed to correlate the most with the negative effects of protein. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't eat protein. Right away, people will start saying, oh, Dr. Baral doesn't believe that you should eat protein. No, I, I, that's not saying that at all, right? I'm not saying that at all. You need protein in your diet. Some people are underfed in terms of protein. And because of that, there's muscle wasting, there's whatever it might be. So there's two sides to this. All I'm saying is that even right now, you might be on a higher protein diet because you're using that specifically to improve maybe what you look at as your glucose levels or your digestion, whatever it might be. Again, I understand. Maybe for you, it's a six month plan and then you're gonna gradually work back in carbs. I get it and totally fine. And I'm not against protein. I eat protein myself, right? So I'm not saying that. But what I wanna share with you is that um, the leucine, which is very anabolic, uh, amino acid, essential amino acid, when we look at that and you correlate the studies, you will see that those with a higher amount of leucine in their diet increased mTOR to a greater degree. Now that will help you build more muscle, but it also seemed to lead to many of the top causes of mortality, the cardiovascular, the blood pressure, diabetes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want you to know that, like that is absolutely stated in the research but they also found something that was, you know, and so what's the highest products with leucine? Meat-based products, uh, then dairy, and then eggs. And, and again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't eat meat. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have dairy if you want some goat's milk or sheep's-based milk and you like that, small part of your diet, okay, that could be fine for you. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't eat eggs. So I'm not saying these things. What I'm talking about is total quantity here today. And there's, there's two more pieces to this. So the next piece is that, those on a predominantly plant-based diet, and I'm not saying, again, I always you know, qualify all these things because people say that I sh you, you should go vegan, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that at all. So what they found though is that people on a predominantly plant-based diet, even if their protein was a little higher, they had less detrimental effects. And the, um, the studies that came out after that said why? Because in plant-based proteins, there, are, there is less leucine you're not going to get as much from the vegetables, the legumes, et cetera. So that was interesting to look at that, right? So now you could actually eat the same protein and not have as many detrimental effects if some of that was coming from plant-based proteins. Okay, now the, the next part is this, is that all of the longest lived people, and again, I know people like to refute the blue zones, but the blue zones are the blue zones. It's legitimate, it really is. The research that has gone into that is, is very well done. And so when you look at that and you see how much longer their health span is and their lifespan, and then you look at, and I've done all the research, right? I've looked at that from all of Dan Butner's work and other people's work, right, that have studied Mediterranean diets, et cetera. Their, their protein intake was about 10% of their macros. Now that might be too low for you and I'm not saying that it, that it is because it actually might be too low and I'm gonna share with you that in a moment too because I like to share with you both sides, not just one side. So their protein, they ate an average of about like 1,770 calories or so per day. So you know when you look at that, let's just say it was you know 350 or so, um, yeah, that's, that's still pretty good. So they're, they're getting, what, I'm just quick math here, like 80 grams or so per day, 70, 70 grams. Um, 70 times four would be 280, uh, or around there, around there, right? So yeah, even a little bit more than that. 80 times four is 320. So when we look at that, that's not a small amount of protein. They were getting a decent amount. But what I will say is they weren't doing weight training. Their main form of exercise was gardening or walking uh, and being active. So if you are weight training, I do believe then you need a little bit more protein. And the reason why you need a little bit more protein is because you actually have greater tissue breakdown. So you could benefit from those amino acids and some mTOR, as long as you're doing intermittent fasting, in order to be able to build back up that protein. Now, does that mean you need a one for one, like one gram of protein per pound of body weight? You don't. Now, do you want one gram of protein per pound of body weight if you're on a hypocaloric diet and you're not eating carbs, well, that might be a different story, right? Because you're actually using protein though to convert to carbohydrates. A lot of people, they don't tell you that. But when you're taking in that much protein, it's absolutely being converted to carbohydrates, right? So um, 
A specific process in the body called gluconeogenesis is allowing you to take those amino acids and actually transform them to usable glucose. And that's why when you're on a high protein diet, if you're using a CGM or you're testing your blood uh, sugar, you can actually see spikes in glucose. And you might have no idea why, because you're not even eating carbs. Well, the protein can spike blood sugar. So, you know, I wanted to share this with you because there's always two sides to the debate. And whenever you see the pendulum swing to one side, you should just be eating a super high protein diet. I asked the individual, how long are you going to be doing this for? Why are you doing it? What are you looking to optimize for? That's the line that I always teach inside of high performance health. What are you looking to optimize for? Because if your main goal is body transformation, building a lot of muscle mass on your body, or working a specific protocol in terms of like digestion, then I don't disagree. But how long are you going to do that for? Right? Like that's my thing. Are you going to do that through your 20s? Okay. Yeah, I did that through my 20s, right? But but is that going to be forever? Cuz if it is, I don't think that you're going to like the results. You might like the results in terms of body transformation, right? You might like that, but I just don't think anybody wants to cut their life short by 20 to 30 years. And that's literally what could happen. You could be dead in your mid 50s to you know, maybe mid 60s instead of living a good 85 to 100 years old. And, and that's absolutely possible with not a ton of work. Now, again, everything, I believe everything is solvable except for cancer right now. And, and, and hopefully we're getting closer and closer to solve cancer. I mean, that, that's the truth. Uh, that's, that's the worry because heart disease, yeah, we can fix that. High blood pressure, we can fix that. Type 2 diabetes, we can fix that. Alzheimer's, we can detect that decades in advance, we can fix that. So it's like, it's not that these things can't be fixed. And early detection for cancer is very helpful as well. But just to put yourself in the best position to succeed, at some point you need to think about diminishing returns. Do I really want to up my protein? Is body transformation that important to me? Now, I believe that you, you should be in good shape for your body. That This body needs to carry you through your life, right? And for many years. And I believe your quality of life will improve if you have less strain on the joints and the body itself. That's just my opinion. Your, your opinion may differ. That's okay. And what I just uh, to wrap up, I'll say this. At some point in your life, you're going to need to, I believe, if you want to, if you put longevity and anti-aging and feeling good for life at the highest hierarchy on your goals for your wellness, you will begin to decrease your total protein for the day. Not too low, but you'll begin to decrease it to a point that it matches that of the best research we have on the longest lived people with the best lifespan, but also the greatest health span. So hopefully this was helpful. If you'd like to go deep on the research, I'm gonna actually send you um, different uh, research uh, articles that you can look at on even how caloric restriction was not even as powerful as protein reduction on lifespan. So pretty, pretty impressive. That was on, um, that was in the journal of physiology. So I'm going to link that up. So all of that will be available at stephencabralcom slash two eight zero five for all the details. And again, just saying that I'm, I'm out there. I'm not trying to be controversial. I'm just trying to help do the best that I can for our community. Thank you so much. Share the show with anyone you believe it could serve. Take care, everybody. And I'll be back tomorrow going over how short bursts of exercise and movement can do decrease all-cause mortality by 40%, and this is just minutes a day. So stay tuned for that show tomorrow. Take care. Did you know that the body really only becomes sick or unbalanced in only two ways? Over time, you become deficient in vital nutrients, and you also accumulate toxins internally and from the environment. As those nutrients diminish and you increase your total toxic load, your body then begins to show the first signs of dis-ease. It's actually quite predictable, and the good news is that if we know how you began to fill up that proverbial rain barrel, we also know how to empty it to begin the healing process. I was fortunate enough to learn this ancient healing process from my mentor after suffering from debilitating diseases for close to a decade. It was only when I began to implement these techniques did I finally overcome my illnesses and go on to live a life of energy and vitality that I now enjoy. I'd like to share with you now what I discovered after traveling all over the world and how to combine the best of ancient healing wisdom with state-of-the-art science. Allow me to teach you exactly how I've been able to help over a quarter of a million people to empty their rain barrel and begin to transform their body and lives into what they've always hoped they could be. To get your copy of the international bestseller, The Rain Barrel Effect, simply go to stephencabral.com forward slash rain barrel.